Welcome everybody. My name is Tara Olapali. I am the co-founder of Camp Arbitration and Mediation Practice. I'm delighted to launch our mediation webinar series hosted by Camp and IDEX Legal. Uh, over the next three months, we will discuss a topic related to mediation and collaborative dispute resolution every two weeks. So a big shout out to IDEX Legal, to Vikas Vij, uh, Akash and Ria for working with us to make this a reality. Uh, today, today we have partnered with Edwards Mediation Academy to bring to you a very important discussion on virtual mediation. So online dispute resolution, ODR, is the buzzword today. Uh, it truly has immense potential to address many of the woes of our court system. But it's also a big word. It encompasses resolution of low value, high volume disputes like uh, e-commerce type cases. And it's also now branched out into high value commercial disputes. And today's discussion is with leading commercial mediators who up until COVID had very bespoke practices that was barely online. But today they've all become expert online mediators. So this discussion will be focused on how online mediation, which is popularly now termed as virtual mediations for these kind of matters, are panning out for uh, complex commercial disputes. Uh, to quickly introduce our speakers, it's truly my privilege to have a, a very, very eminent panel. Truly, it does not get very much better than this. Our speaker moderator is Bruce Edwards. He's one of the most experienced commercial mediators of our times. Uh, Bruce started as a professional mediator in 1985 when probably mediation as a profession did not really exist. So in large part, he has played an instrumental role in creating this profession of uh, mediators. Uh, Bruce has mediated over 7,000 disputes, most of them complex commercial disputes. He's played a foundational role in setting up JAMS, which is one of the most successful uh, ADR companies uh, in the world. And now Bruce and his wife, Susan, have also started Edwards Mediation Academy, where they bring high quality online mediation courses uh, from the perspective of experience, uh, experienced mediators sharing their knowledge of mediation to the world. So thank you so much, Bruce, for being, a part, for being uh, with us today and for hosting this discussion. Thank you, Tara, and for the kind introduction. Thank you. We also have Mr. Mr. Sriram Panchu. Mr. Panchu is, uh, does not need much introduction, popularly known as the godfather of mediation uh -huh. in India. <laughs> Mr. Panchu set up the first court annex mediation program with the Chennai High Court or the Madras High Court in 2005. Uh, Mr. Panchu has mediated innumerable disputes. We all know him as the mediator of the Ayodhya dispute. He's also a very senior, well-respected member of the bar. Uh, Mr. Panchu has published many, many books, including most recently uh, one on the commercial mediation monograph. So thank you, Mr. Panchu, for being part of us, uh, for being part of this discussion. And uh, we're excited to listen to all the experience that you've had in this space. Thank you, Tara. Pleasure to be here, uh, especially with Bruce and Laila. And we also have Laila Olapali, who in full disclosure is also my mother. Uh, Laila is the founder of Camp Arbitration and Mediation Practice, which is a, a pioneering private mediation institution here in, uh, in Bangalore. Laila was a lawyer for nearly two decades with the Karnataka High Court and the Supreme Court of India up until she encountered mediation. Uh, in 2007, she was the founding coordinator of the Bangalore Mediation Center uh, again, a very uh, successful co annex mediation program, and she served as the founding coordinator up until 2012. Uh, she's been a full-time mediator since, uh, since 2012. In 2015, set up CAMP, uh, and her focus, along with all of us at CAMP, is to get mediation as part of the uh, default option when it comes to disputants. So over to you, thank, to Bruce, uh, over to you, Bruce. Thank you all for being part of this panel and we're looking forward to this very engaging discussion. To all our viewers, uh, you can please send out questions on the chat inbox. We will be uh, manning it and there will be a, a point midway through a little 
beyond the midway mark where we will uh, open up some of the questions that we have received to uh, pose it to our panelists. So over to you, Bruce. Thank you for hosting and moderating this discussion. Thank you, Tara, again for the kind introduction. It's indeed my sincere pleasure to be with the viewers and particularly with my dear friends, Sharam and Laila. Uh, it's just a joy <coughs> to continue uh, the effort uh, we're all making collectively in India to discuss mediation topics and, and bring <coughs> uh, mediation in its finest forms uh, to India. Uh, today we have the pleasure really of talking about uh, mediation uh, mediating commercial disputes in the age of COVID-19. So let me start by wishing everybody well. I hope that people are in all good health and your families are doing well in these difficult times. <clears throat> um, I think it's probably best to start to question uh, for our panel, uh, which is really the why question. And uh, one of my good friends who is a psychotherapist and mediation trainer always tell, tells me that if you start with the why question and you understand the why, the how will follow. And so why are we, why are we here today? And why is it that, uh, uh, um, Lila, I'll start with you, that this is such a hot topic uh, in India, the topic of uh, online dispute resolution. And uh, let me hear your thoughts on that initially this morning or this evening. So thank you, Bruce. It's such a delight to be with all of you. Um, yes, uh, mediation is new in India. It's taking its baby steps. That's fine. We, we know mediation to be a process that uses communication, that builds communication and helps parties to negotiate, coach parties to ne negotiate productively. And today mediation is being acclaimed as a good process for multi-party, uh, multi issue, complex uh, disputes, uh, high emotions. So we are in a good place. And as Tara said, now ODR is a buzzword. ODR, as we understand, as is popularly understood now, is dispute resolution using technology. To what extent does it build communication? To what extent does it enter into complex coaching? As we hear of it, it's for low value, high volume disputes, for e-commerce disputes. And I'm sure this can develop, evolve, to build in all that we are seeking in mediation. But now it is important to bring clarity. How do we use technology? For which disputes? How can we tailor it to the, uh, to the dispute that we are seeking to resolve? So I think that clarity is important. And if we don't bring that cl uh, clarity, we may throw the baby out with the bathwater. So we just have to be careful. And that's why I think this is a very important discussion, Bruce. Thank you, Lila. I like your topic about clarity and you remind me that it might be helpful for us to define terms. Uh, let me define a term or two as we use it in the United States and see if that resonates with your practice and experience as well. Uh, in its simplest form, as you've just pointed out so well, um, ODR really simply means alternative dispute resolution plus technology in some form. And we'll talk over the next hour or so about how that's evolved and in what forms. Um, we're now in the COVID-19 environment in the United States, I think, shifting uh, in commercial cases to use the, the word virtual mediation uh, to really signify uh, mediation in the context of a visual environment such as we are right now. <clears throat> and over the course of the next hour, I'm sure we'll have opportunity to define additional and related terms, but those are how at least I use the terms as we move forward. <clears throat> uh, Sharam, does that match up with your experience in terms of the terminology? And then I have a question for you. <clears throat> I have a strong point of disagreement with you. Who's... Good place to start. <laughs> Um, I'm fine with 
you know, we use on um, ODR, online dispute resolution, you know, through the use of technology. But I think to use the term virtual mediation for conducting mediation online uh, mm -hmm. is to underrate online mediation. I think, in fact, online mediation is turning out to be a superior form of mediation. I would say enhanced mediation. Enhanced I would say mediation. superior enhanced mediation. I like that. Because it really that. enables us to bring out uh, the full capacity of mediation techniques. And it enable, enables us to bring in maximum levels of efficiency and contact and communication. I'm uh, going to come today, back to that. Yes, oh, yes. No, I, I interrupted you. I apologize. So, um, um, so I think we are able, through online mediation, we're able to deliver mediation to the last, you know, to the last digit. Um, I think it, it, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a method which is tailor-made for mediation. And I'm delighted to be able to use this. I have used online mediation even before COVID started. But since COVID came, I've shifted my entire practice to online. And mind you, I don't think I have a moment to spare. Wow. Because I want to come back to that. Uh, yes, yes. So whenever you are going to come back, I have lots of things to say uh, about online mediation. And, you know, because I just love it. Fabulous. That's a great, great introduction. I always find in these conversations about using technology in mediation that it is important to spend a moment emphasizing the value of mediation skills as a prerequisite to being able to work fluently uh, and effectively online. Sharam is one of the leading mediation instructors in your country. Can you just take a moment and comment on that importance of sort of mastering the mediation skills as a prerequisite to moving into an online environment? Of course, I think you have to be fundamentally a good mediator to start with. There's no two ways about that, yes. You cannot make up for any lack of uh, a mediation technique or mediation knowledge or mediation skills by thinking you can use the online process. So you have to start out by being, yes, a good mediator. Um, so you must, you know, hone in your skills, uh, do your groundwork as a mediator, acquire the experience, acquire the training, uh, co-mediate, reflect, learn how to mediate. Uh, and then, as I said, online gives you this wonderful additional capacity to leverage your skills to the maximum. But there's no doubt that, you know, you must start off by being the best mediator you can. Thank you for emphasizing that point. I think it's, it's uh, bears repeating that mediation skills are what allow us to work effectively in an online environment and technology will not overcome for skill deficiency. Yeah. Let's talk for just a moment about the history of how we've gotten to this point in time so that we can best understand the trajectory moving forward. As Lila pointed out so well, in the United States uh, in the 1990s, ODR, Online Dispute Resolution, began really under the uh, guidance of a gentleman uh, named Colin Rule. And uh, the, for those of you who are not familiar with Colin Rule. I urge you to Google him and read some of his uh, works. Uh, he's written for various Harvard uh, publications. Uh, but in the 1990s, he was hired by uh, eBay to set up an online dispute resolution program. And as Lila said, uh, the characteristics of that program were because of the nature of eBay's online transaction or e-commerce business the online dispute resolution program was set up to manage conflicts arising between buyers and sellers of products online. And that really evolved then into a situation where they mediated literally millions of fairly simplistic, small dollar, high volume uh, disputes. And then it began from there, moving to PayPal, moving to other large corporations. Um, and I would say about five or six years ago, I began to um, witness a debate in the mediation um, profession about the value of online uh, dispute resolution. And for many who came to this profession uh, in the United States uh, out of a pure uh, motivation, a belief that uh, in-person intervention was at the soul of mediation, 
and that to effectively communicate and deal with emotions and other things, online dispute resolution was a, a distant uh, cousin to uh, what we aspired to. And that was a debate that raged for a number of years in the United States. And then over time, we saw things develop around the world. We saw um, brick and mortar courtrooms in the, uh, the United Kingdom and in Canada being replaced completely with online dispute resolution. Uh, in the Netherlands, the divorce court became, began uh, completely uh, to become an online dispute resolution uh, protocol. And, and then um, for those of us that sort of stood quietly on the sidelines, not particularly comfortable with technology in the last five years, our commercial practices started to evolve as well. And more and more, we began to use alternate forms of communication in our mediation effort, including um, texting and phone calls and emails and uh, Zoom and Skype uh, connections with people to a point where there were days I would start a mediation with 15 or 20 people only to find a, a few coming physically into my office and the rest I would have to engage using some different technology. So over the last few years, technology has been the fourth party in the room. And so it's not now in the United States any longer a binary choice. Are we using technology or not? It is really a question of what is the most effective use of that technology. So that's how things have evolved in the United States. I'm curious, uh, Lila and Sharam, uh, about your experience and witnessing a similar kind of growth in uh, um, India. Uh, Sharam, let me start with you with that question. How would you describe the evolution of online dispute resolution in India, recognizing you're still in the throes of it? Um, all right. Very quickly, a recap. I think India's mediation is, isn't as uh, uh, long tenured as it is in the United States. For us, effectively, we started off in 2005 with our first fort and next center. But we moved very rapidly since then. And across the country now, we have a few thousand mediators uh, mediating millions of cases, but basically under the court annex scheme. This is a time now we're moving on to open up mediation to private professional practice. Um, there are, as I say, four factors which have happened recently, which are propelling mediation to center stage. And I call them the four beneficial horsemen of the apocalypse to avert the apocalypse. The first is the Singapore Med uh, Convention, which has opened out to big business uh, the clarity that they can now engage in mediation settlements with their forced confidence that if there's ever a dispute about implementation, they can have implementation for the asking in any part of the world, which is a signatory to the convention. And they have it for the asking without questions being asked, the court will just enforce it, which is such a change, huge change from you know, arbitration and uh, litigation. Uh, the second is India's, you know, um, almost revolutionary, I would say, introduction. What is it? Uh, the second is India's uh, revolutionary introduction of the concept of pre-institution mediation. There is a mandatory mediation before you file a, ca a commercial case. Tempered somewhat by the relaxation that if you needed an interim order, you could still file. But uh, over time, that will become a little tighter. So that our law will now mandate a prior mediation uh, to institution of a court. And that is huge, uh, both in concept and in practice. Uh, the third is, I think, the likely emergence now of a comprehensive mediation legislation, which will cover all areas of practice, procedure, and institutions, uh, court annexed, private, cross-border, uh, implementation, ethics, guidelines, everything. Uh, so far, we've, we've had you know, scattered mediation laws, bits and pieces all over the place. Now we are framing a comprehensive enactment, you know, tailored towards mediation. That's a huge step. And the fourth fact, the fourth horseman is online brought about by COVID. 
because, mm -hmm. and if I may take a minute here, Bruce, I just like to say that this is giving us a level of both instant and constant engagement with parties. And I'll explain that. Instant engagement. I had, uh, this would be, my eyes were open one day because I got a call at 8.30 in the evening uh, from a party saying, you know, we have a huge contract going on and it's going to be canceled tonight. Uh, what can we do? I said, it depends whether you can get everybody onto a telephone, onto, onto a Zoom call. There were 9.30, we had people from six cities, uh, six, six, sorry, six cities spread across different countries, uh, six parties and three legal advisors, nine people from different cities, all. We, by 11.30, we kind of averted the disaster. And over the next three days till the end of the week, we could sort it out. And I had that CEO call me on Sunday and he said, I am amazed. In the old days, I would have taken this much time to even explain to my lawyer what my problem was in order to issue a notice and get a stay from a court. <clears throat> and today you, we have resolved this issue, all of us sitting together in a matter of four days, we've resolved it. And, you know, I, you, you know, this, 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 he couldn't believe it, you know, frankly, this has happened like this. And uh, uh, the other thing is a level of constant engagement. I'm just in the mediation, which I'm doing for a family uh, in, in North India, four brothers and two sisters, where they have disputes about vast amounts of properties. And they've been fighting for years and years and years. And I have sat with them for the last three months on an almost daily basis to get them to agreement and implement it. And there is no way I could have done that. Uh, you know, I'm based in Chennai. I couldn't have even run that mediation. But today I've been able to get them to a point where they are like, you know, home and dry and they're through. And that's because of online mediation. How else, you know, will I sit with the party, you know, different, and they are in multiple cities themselves. You know, three months. Brick by brick by brick. And I now think that I look back at my earlier mediations and I think if I had online, I would cut short that time. It would be at 2080. What took me 80 days, I would do in 20. You know, so it, the, the speed, the level of engagement is amazing. The other thing which matters is, you see, I'm finding that for complex commercial matters, you need multiple levels of mediator engagement. Some matters it's adequate to get a breakthrough and then the parties will work it on their own from then on. But there are other matters where the mediator has to stay with the parties even after you get that basic agreement, you know, to see it through, uh, to stay the full course. Um, and that's very difficult for us if you don't have online. It's virtually impossible. Um, but it makes a lot of difference to the parties I'm finding. Not only does it give them this maximum comfort of mediators with us, but as we all know in commercial matters, the devil is often in the details. And it's when the details are going through that that devil pops up, you know, to just scuttle the entire agreement. And if the parties have their mediator with them to sort it out, you know, there's, there's nothing like it. The third is I think when parties have a trusted mediator, you know, you give them an online procedure, they make use of that trust in the mediator. And ever so often you will have parties saying, look, you know, I think this is how it should be. I'm willing to go to 50. The other guy says, you know, 100, even an implementation, you know, sorting out the final points. And they'll say, look, you know, we can't really sort this out. Let's just call Mr. Pancho and say, you know, you know this whole thing, come on, come on, let's help us see through. So even in the level of, you know, taking it down and all complex commercial matters, you know, our agreement, you break through, you structure it, and then you have to implement it, um, uh, you know, see it through stage one, two, three. So for all these reasons, and clients are loving it. They can't believe they have something like this. They're loving it. I'll, when you, I mean, another question, I'll tell you about how the legal community is taking to it. But as far as the parties are concerned, this is manna from heaven. Sir. That's, those are great examples, vivid examples of the power and potential of online dispute resolution. Thank you for sharing those.
Um, Lila, let me uh, turn to you for a moment in terms of your experience with online dispute resolution, what you're hearing from others in the mediation community as, the, as you at camp work to educate people and offer mediation services. What, what do you see from your vantage point about what's going on in the world of online dispute resolution? <clears throat> and you'll need to unmute your mic. There we go. So, uh, Bruce, I totally agree with Sri Ram that we've really reached a good place. And um, I want to tell you that it evolved. And like there is, uh, you know, there is the opportunity in adversity, this is what COVID has brought to us. Um, in 2011, I, I, when I was a visiting scholar at Stanford, Colin Rule had come to talk about online dispute resolution. At that time, I was already a mediator for a few years. And um, when I listened to him, it really didn't make sense to me. Um, I thought, not for the kind of cases that I'm mediating. Subsequently, in 2018, Agami, promoted mediation in India, online mediation. And many platforms came up. We had Sama, Coda. Again, I didn't think CAMP was really going to be doing that kind of mediation. When COVID happened, we at CAMP knew that we had to adapt. We have to modify our practice a bit. We have to bring in the same experience that we were giving our parties earlier online. When parties, we use the screen, the online technologies, parties have to feel the same kind of connection, the, the same ease and comfort. So there was a lot of work that we had to do at camp to make this happen. All of us mediators, we did training in Zoom, training in uh, the correct platform. And we sat for hours, days in fact, how do we adapt our existing techniques to make it conducive to the online world? And today, if you ask me for an analogy, I think, of a carriage being drawn by two very strong horses. The carriage is mediation and the horses. One is the mediator's mediation skills and the other is the mediator's ability to handle technology. When both these are equally powerful in a mediator, then you get the best experience online. And I call that virtual mediation. You're virtually making them feel that they are having all the connection, all the ease and comfort on screen, which they would have otherwise felt if it was a face-to-face -face mediation. And obviously, Sri Ram is doing it. Sri Ram has I mean, with his skills of mediation, he has been able to adapt and modify and bring in the same experience. And my request to all the mediators is to be aware when you come online, the two houses need to be equally skilled and equally powerful. That is a great analogy, Lila, a great visual uh, for us to remember. Let me pause us all on the panel for just a moment. We've promised this to be an interactive program, and I would like to um, invite us to put on the screen by our friends at IDEX Legal uh, one of several questions that we want to gauge uh, the audience's response to over the course of the next hour. <clears throat> and so if I could ask them to put a question up on the screen that we're gonna ask our audience to respond to uh, at this point, that would be uh, much appreciated. And the question, uh, for those of you who may not have your reading glasses on this evening, 
how many virtual mediations have you experienced so far? Okay. And the, uh, and the uh, choices are uh, none, less than five, between five and 10, or greater than 10. So take a moment and just respond to that. Obviously, uh, we're just trying to gauge the audience response, not any individual. <clears throat> and that will give us a snapshot of where things stand in your experience, which we're very interested in learning. In mediation, this is what we call the power of silence. What, uh, okay, that's uh, uh, enough time, I think, for a fairly straightforward question and answer sequence. Uh, if our friends at IDEX Legal wish to post the uh, responses that they've accumulated, um, that would be uh, good. So you can see from the responses that the, the vast majority of people have not yet experienced uh, virtual or online mediation, almost 60%. And another 28% uh, have done less than five or fewer than five. So uh, that is uh, really 86% uh, uh, of people who have done either none or less than five, suggesting to me that uh, we are just getting started in, in this process for many. Uh, and uh, only 6% have done uh, more than, than 10 and find themselves in, in Sharam's world. Um, we've Let's talk for just a minute about... Um, sort of what I think Sharam was introducing us to, which is, um, you know, can this be effective? And I'll, I'll just offer this um, anecdote from my own company. As Tara was kind enough to mention, uh, my company, uh, not mine alone, but the company that I help work with, JAMS, we're the largest provider of mediation services commercially in the United States. And we are about a $200 million enterprise in the United States. And since March, I'm happy to report because uh, there were times where I wasn't sure we would ever be able to say this, but I would say at this point, we are about 80% online uh, in terms of our mediation, predominantly mediation and some arbitration practice. And that's quite a statement to say that in six months, uh, we can go uh, from a company that was engaged in over 16,000 disputes a year with over 400 mediators to pivot that quickly to an online virtual environment. Also recognizing, uh, and I can say this because you all are 7,000 miles away, most of my colleagues are in a, in a demographic where technology does not come easily. And there's an awful lot of, of quick learning that was required. Personally, I was in the middle of a two-day mediation involving over 20 parties that were in my office when our office manager came in at the end of the first day and said, our local government, our mayor, said we're a non-essential business and need to shut down at five o'clock and everybody was sent home. And I immediately went home and got online and started learning about how to Zoom mediation so I could continue my mediation the next day. And it was that thrown into the fire kind of moment for many of us that characterized our transition to this virtual world. Um, but let's um, uh, talk more specifically, I think, now that we've all set the stage. Uh, Sharam, um, what, what does it take uh, in, in this uh, online mediation world uh, for you to be effective? What is it about the online process that works so well? And you've, you've already begun this conversation, but in contrast to your prior life of traveling around and, and uh, working with people in person, what, what does make this uh, virtual program so effective? Go ahead and turn your microphone on so we can uh, make sure we hear you. <clears throat> Thank you, Bruce. Uh, first, I would suggest that you tell your mayor that mediation is an essential <laughs> practice. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, essential service. Yeah. Um, so what, what, is, what, what, what makes for the efficiency of an online mediation? I think that's a great question. Um, I think you have to spend some time educating parties and lawyers on how it's going to work. They may come from a non-comfort zone, from a non-knowledge zone. 
So I think one very important session is to explain to them that this is going to be as good, um, if not better, and I always stress, you know, we can make it much, much better than the old system. And this is how it works. Uh, this is how we will be communicating. These are the tools you need. Uh, this is how we, in fact, I, I would run some practice sessions with them. A junior, a mediation associate would take them through the ropes, parties and lawyers, uh, till they get comfortable with, you know, their, their laptops, uh, the Zoom system, the interactions, the chat rooms, uh, take, putting, you know, putting them to different rooms, structuring the whole thing. So they need that measure of knowledge and that comfort. Okay. When, when we draft the agreements of mediation, we need to pay special attention to certain aspects of confidentiality. Because I'm not there present with them to ensure that there's nobody else in the room at a certain time. You know, presence of parties. So they need to be, uh, you know, entered into certain uh, covenants of confidentiality that they will not be recording a session where recording where we do not agree on recording that they will not covertly record so there are some things that need to be taken care of there on a legal angle um, we then uh, we we set out a process note to them a very detailed process note saying this is how the mediation will run and you know come back with whatever questions and clarifications so i think a good part that preparation is a big part of the whole thing the second is the technology. And I, I like using a nice wide screen for my mediation. So I've attached, and I'm just giving you some practical, you know, please, uh, please. tips. Um, I've attached to my laptop, I've attached a wide screen. So when I have this wide screen, and when I can zone in on a party for speaking, I get the full display of facial emotions, as I would were I sitting across. So I'm not losing anything on, you know, reading emotions, reading, you know, reading reactions, body language, reading a twitch of the eye or a sudden stiffening of the face. I don't lose anything. So that wide screen enables me to make up this gap between, you know, uh, doing it on screen and actually being there. Uh, thirdly, I've invested some time and resources in getting a good bike system so that, you know, uh, I, I, uh, I am heard and I can hear well. I've also invested time in getting feedback from people. I've come to realize that your communication in a virtual mediation uh, is different from what it is across the table. And one of the things I realized was that um, Un until I adjusted my camera, I found that I was, you could, I would be speaking, looking down. Because I would be looking at the, on the eyes of the person, but the camera was on top of the laptop, so I would actually be looking down all the time. So it took me that feedback to make me realize that I must adjust the camera differently. So that I'm at all times meeting the eye of the person with whom I'm speaking. I also realized that I have to articulate differently that your articulation in a, a, a closed room, face-to-face, -face, is different from the articulation on screen. And you have to articulate differently. Uh, these are all things one picked up, you know, over experience. Um, and you ask people for feedback. So there are some finer points, you know, of the game, uh, which of course, you know, as we evolve and we share it, people will get to know. Um, so I think one pays attention to this. I will also tell you an interesting aspect because I used to hear it said that, you know, uh, your participants will miss, uh, you know, they'll feel uncomfortable about this screen uh, uh, online mediations. On the contrary, I think people feel very comfortable and secure from the confines of their houses. And this has nothing to do with COVID. Mind you, we get people to into who who's, who we are mediating very difficult portions of their lives, whether it's a broken marriage, or you know a broken commercial engagement. It may be people who've been in a partnership firm for 20, 40 years, you know, as much as a long-term marriage, and to negotiate a breakage of a relationship 
is a distress, very distressing situation. I find that talking from the confines of their homes, they actually feel easier. Not having to bear the hostility of a one-to-one -one contact in a room, but actually feeling easier, more comfortable, more relaxed, and more willing you know, to open up. So to me, this is an eye-opener on many fronts. So I think the, the thing I want to convey is that being open to the fact that this is a different medium. And you have to adapt and learn and innovate and think about the fact that this is a little medium. What do I need to be doing to make myself as effective as possible? Those are excellent points, Sharam. <clears throat> and I, what I like especially about them is your attention to the detail, the simple things like making sure your camera eye level is consistent for communication. Um, this idea of people's comfort level aided by the fact they're coming to you from their home. <clears throat> um, I recently mediated a case involving a young man who had been in a motorcycle accident and was a um, paralyzed from the chest level down. <clears throat> and we were able to engage him from his hospital bed in his living room. <clears throat> and not only did it make him more comfortable, but I think it gave everybody in the mediation a vivid picture, literally, of what his life was like in any given moment, surrounded right. by equipment, surrounded by right. caretakers, surrounded. One could even get, and one does get in the broader context, just a snapshot of someone's life by seeing right. how they decorate their home in the background. And there is yeah. an element yeah. of being able to connect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, true, way true, way true. Um, uh, Lila, let me turn to you for a moment. Um, in terms of, uh, those kinds of suggestions, uh, do you want to build on, on Sharam or do you want to take on the question of what challenges you see or hear from people as they contemplate moving into a virtual or enhanced uh, mediation world, to use Sharam's term? You'll need to uh, undo your mic. <laughs> uh, Sriram has well covered uh, the finer points. Um, I, I just maybe want to add one or two points to it. Um, I think now with the virtual online situation, it enables a mediator to think, to design very broad, think creatively. Uh, I, I did a virtual mediation where the average age of the parties was 80. And they were located in... Uh, three different countries, five different cities. Um, so I just didn't know how I'm going to connect with these people, get them to participate effectively. And then what we did was we included the children of these people. And of course, we have the time buddy. We created schedules that the children, they were all busy doctors and lawyers, but they could make one or two hours available. We brought them all into the mediation and that made it possible for these, this older generation to participate and resolve their dispute. So I think, you know, the ability to, to be creative and to think broad has increased. Another point I realized in virtual mediation the attention span of people on screen is not too much. They have not committed a day to mediation. They have not braved the Bangalore traffic. Mm -hmm. So when they, so, you know, when they do all that, they're ready to take a little more time and give a little more time. But when it is on the screen, they click the button, they are there. They want it efficient. They want it productive. They want it quick. I feel, we can become more strategic and more focused for each session. The lawyers and the parties are guided to be more strategic and more efficient. Very right. Yeah. So uh, I think well said. And let's talk about that for just a moment. I, I think you've put your finger on an aspect of all of us, which is our attention spans. We know from neurobiology that the sort of optimal time for specific focus and concentrated learnings about only 90 minutes, which um, 
has grave implications for those of us who are used to having people in eight or 10 hour sessions. And one of the things I've experienced, I'll be interested in yours, is I'm doing much more of these multiple uh, sessions, shorter, two, three, four hour sessions spread out over days than I am the longer full yeah. day, eight or 10 hour exhausted. Yeah. 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 Shram, is that true for you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. In the old days, I would have had to go to Bangalore or Delhi, you know, park myself in a hotel and had to run sessions from morning to night because, you know, I'm coming from outside, other parties are coming from outside. And it used to be, you know, a hugely draining process. It also would kind of, you know, push you to, uh, to try and conclude matters. Um, it, it sometimes didn't give you the flexibility of time, especially when parties said, look, sir, I've got a flight to take back to the United States tomorrow. I have to leave tonight. Um, so there were a lot of constraints. Now you don't have any of that. I can simply say, well, we're going to sit for three hours uh, today and we're going to make as much progress as we can. And then I'm going to give you each some homework. I want you to reflect on some things. I want you to work out some options. I want to break up some of you into different groups to talk about this and we'll reconvene tomorrow. It is just so easy. You know, so as I said, you're, you're able to strategize it better. You're able to handle, um, you know, the requirement to, to suit what that case needs. Uh, and a lot, I think now we're moving to a process, I was just thinking about it this evening, where I think the mediator is becoming not just the person um, who is able to move them from conflict to a resolution, but also I think the mediator is now becoming somebody with the aided capability of actually managing the implementation of that solution um, to, to the extent that may be required in particular cases. Some cases may need nothing. Some cases may actually lead, need a level of intervention and I would say grip. See, parties like the grip the mediator brings in. Yes. You know, when you've taken them up to that point and then, you know, they have to you know, go ahead and implement the fact that, that we use the term judges retain season of the case. I think with online mediators can retain season of the dispute and actually see them, you know, down to the end of that, uh, you know, it's uh, to that marathon race. I think you, it's, you, it's my, my impression of what you're saying is consistent with my own experience, meaning rather than just a surgical intervention, a doctor coming into the operating room, you're now greeting them at the front door of the hospital and you're wheeling them out at the back end of their stay uh, yeah. Yeah. in a wheelchair to their car and calling yeah. them up the next day at their home to find out how yeah. they're doing. And yeah. it's that yeah. Yeah. What we call sort of soup to nuts intervention. Yeah. Yeah, it's full end, you know, full, full end, full end, right, full end. Yeah. Let's, let's shift gears for just a moment, because as we all know, um, we are not, as mediators, the only people in the room. <laughs> and uh, another important group of stakeholders that uh, need to be addressed and discussed is, are the attorneys representing the clients. Uh, I'm curious, um, <clears throat> Lila, um, wh why do you think uh, this conversation is important uh, regarding uh, what we describe as uh, uh, the lawyers as stakeholders in mediation. And what do you want them to know about this process from your perspective as a mediator? Um, Bruce, from my experience, I feel today the lawyers play uh, an even more important role because we are dealing with parties who have tremendous anxiety. They have anxiety about technology, anxiety about mediation process. Most of them have never done a mediation prior to this. So all that we teach in advocacy in mediation really becomes important. They, and you know, the, uh, the importance of forming a professional team is, is very high. 
the, the lawyers with their parties and the mediator are working towards the same goal. The lawyers need to understand the facts. They are coming in for these sessions, more strategic, more focused. What exactly is it that the parties want? What is the factual position on this? What is the legal? What are the underlying concerns? What are the options? Lawyers are much more involved. How are their parties feeling in one mediation? Uh, again, the same 80, average age, 80 mediation. Um, I told the lawyers, please alert me if you notice your parties are tiring. I'm keeping my um, telephone next to me. Send me a message. So they, they are keeping their finger on the pulse and they know that's their responsibility. And, and they have several more discussions with their parties. As Sri Ram said, they have, they are given homework. They are, uh, they are asked to come prepared. So they interact much more with their parties to come prepared, focused, strategic for the next session. So I feel the lawyers really have a very important role to play. The skills in mediation uh, of advocacy in mediation and advocacy in litigation are very different. It's more marked when it's online. Toxic, any, any kind of aggression can bring in more toxic, toxicity on an online medium than on a physical medium is what I feel. I like your uh, logistical invitation set up alternate channels of communication to overcome people's <laughs> fear of being isolated somehow in the technology. And I will inevitably, uh, when I'm mediating on the main screen, uh, I will have my other computer you know, set up at my side. I will have my text capability set up with the phone and invite people to reach out to me to, as Sharam says, provide feedback on the communication. If there are things they want to share uh, confidentially, uh, sometimes I'm in a meeting and they'll say, you know, stop talking or this is, you know, not working to our advantage. Let's move into private session. Whatever the moment is, you have these alternate channels of communication and you point that out so well. <clears throat> Sharam, uh, speak to that same topic that is the lawyer's role in mediation and what you see them needing to do, those that do things well, what are those things, those that miss an opportunity uh, in your uh, mind's eye? What, what is that missed opportunity? Um, yeah, I think this is a hugely important topic and you know, it's good to hear Laila say what she said. Um, let's address one thing, you know, right up front. Lawyers have a principal fear about mediation. Is it gonna take away my revenue? Does ADR translate itself into alarming drop of revenue? <laughs> if Mr. Panchu says that he will start a matter, a dispute which has blossomed on Tuesday night and close it on Sunday afternoon, what the hell does this do for my fees in this huge million dollar case, uh, which could have dragged on, you know, for virtual eternity? <laughs> the lawyer is going to be thinking that. And unless we as mediators, and unless the systems, the structure, and the law do not provide those answers, mediation will not take off. Because you cannot expect clients to come to the table without lawyers. And you cannot expect lawyers, you know, to survive in an atmosphere where they think that mediation is loaded with disincentives against them. But here's the good news. If you apply your mind as a mediator, you come up with a solution to that. What does our mediation training tell us? It tells us when there is a problem, look for options. Look for long-term interest and look for options. And the answer is very simple. The long-term interest of the client and the long-term interest of the lawyer in fact getting a good settlement should be made convergent. And that translates very simply into telling the client, please work out a proper financial structure with your lawyers for the mediation. Your lawyers are giving you a first class professional service. 
and I emphasize this to the clients in every first meeting. I make it very clear that mediation, not only is mediation professional, but the service the law is giving the client is a professional service. Uh, for one, it is not only professional, it is hugely important. Um, even though the client may be the decision, the lawyer's role is hugely important. It's a professional service, and it is something to which the lawyer must be, you know, well compensated in revenue. And sometimes I just take the CEO aside and say, look, let's be clear. Uh, make sure that your lawyer is on the same page with you. Put yourself in the feet of the lawyer. Uh, he wants to be, you'll be want to be compensated for the work you're doing for a client. And often the CEO asks me, what do you suggest? And I said, my suggestion is simple. Calculate what this will take you if you're going in for a full page trial. Will it cost you $1 million for a full page trial? Whatever it costs you. Take a reasonable percentage of that. 25, 30, 30, whatever percentage is reasonable. Tell your lawyer that if he give, gets your first rate settlement, he's going to get that money up front now. This benefits you because you have saved the balance of that legal fee. Your lawyer is ecstatic because, you know, instead of having to earn this money over God knows how many years. And as uh, sometimes I, lawyers tell me, sir, he says, you know, uh, nobody can think long term of my profession. I don't know whether the client will stay, whether the cause will stay, or whether I will stay. So if I'm getting good money up front, there's nothing like it. Uh, so I tell the client, make sure this benefits your lawyer. You see, at the end of the day, when the client has that huge settlement, the legal fees don't really matter to him. Please understand one thing. The legal fee is a very small component of that settlement. So when you tell him, and he's happy about the settlement, and when you say, measure your lawyer's fees properly and reward your lawyer well. He's happy to do it. I've never seen, and lawyers tell me this, they come back and say, sir, this is amazing. In, and, and tell me in COVID times, I've had lawyers come to me and say, sir, we find this amazing because in these COVID times for our litigative work, our standard clients are complaining about our bills. The kind of bills which are passed through earlier, you know, without comment, uh, come back they're now saying why don't you reduce this by half whatever you're having great difficulty with our standard litigation bills but he says i have no difficulty with the bills that i have to charge a client for a successful mediation they are delighted at the result they're happy to pay my bills so we need to be we need to tailor advice to parties we need to structure things and we need to make sure see that lawyer is putting in you know the lawyer has to prepare for the case He's got to know the case as well as he knows any litig uh, litigated case. The lawyer has to sit down and plan with the client what the strategy is. The mm -hmm. lawyer has to participate and they have to work out with the client, you know, who takes uh, the lead step in this phase, uh, who takes the lead step in the next phase. And the lawyer has got to be involved every inch of the way in, you know, fashioning the agreement, the implementation. It's, it's, it's hugely professional, very specialized. Um, and when you explain this to the client, you see, the lawyer explaining it, the client's not going to get it so well. But if I tell him, look, this is crucially important. And unless your lawyer is on the same page, you may not get a good enough settlement. That's all it needs to, for the mediator to tell the client that. The rest of it is done. Let me, I, I want to just build on that. I'm so glad, Sharam, today or tonight that you brought up an issue that often gets skirted in the conversation about mediation. And as I travel around the world and try and help implement mediation in different countries, it is essential that we engage the big stakeholder group of attorneys, this conversation around the value proposition of mediation and how we align historical attorney fee structures to incentivize both lawyers and clients to pursue and engage mediation is essential to our long-term success. Yeah, and yeah. when one, like you say, when one really drills down on the value of a skilled mediation advocate and the value they can bring to their client, it demands sort of a different uh, concept or paradigm of pay structure. And so I encourage people in their own communities to revisit those conversations and think about how to align the lawyer's interest because it, the, as we all know on this panel, um, 
training lawyers to effectively participate in mediation is almost as essential as training mediators at the end of the table. I want to do this for a moment because we promised everyone this would be an interactive program. I see the question and answer uh, box is sort of flashing lights. I'd like to, to maybe take a question or two for our panels and, and see, see what's on people's minds as they listen to Sharam and Lila and myself. Um, Tara, will you be kind enough to assist us in uh, uh, picking a question or two for the panel? Yes, uh, Bruce, my pleasure. Yes, there have been lots of questions and I do want to let everyone know that we will get to as many of them as possible. In the event that we're not able to cover your question, we will uh, uh, send out an email response to you. So please be assured that even if we don't get to your question right now, we will answer it via email. Uh, Bruce, how would you like me to do it? One question at a time or could I bunch up a couple of questions uh, um, together? If, if the questions form uh, under a similar topic, you can, can read uh, you know, one or two of them together and then we can invite uh, Lila and Sharam to respond. Okay, so um, uh, 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 one question it has been, uh, that has been raised a couple of times is to get the clarification between an online mediation and a virtual mediation. So how does, how does this panel see? Is there a difference between online mediation and virtual mediation? If there is, if you could highlight that. Um, uh, another question that I'll, that I'll also pose before you that came up a couple of times in different forms is how are parties responding um, to an online dispute resolution, especially from a confidentiality perspective? And what are some of the steps that mediators are taking to be able to uh, effectively prepare clients and, uh, and lawyers to engage in a mediation process? Great. Uh, Sharam, do you want to um, begin uh, by addressing your, well, let me do this. I think we can dispense fairly quickly with the, the definitional part by revisiting it. And then I want to turn to Lila and Sharam for the substantive. Um, <clears throat> online dispute resolution encompasses a whole range of various technologies from the early days of people just using keystrokes and a narrative back and forth without any visual engagement. And that's online dispute resolution. Um, <clears throat> the virtual world, as I refer to it, or the enhanced world, as Sharam has called it, has really involved platforms more like Zoom, where you have the opportunity to visually interact with people on the platform. <clears throat> and yet they're all fall under the heading of online dispute resolution, which I remind you, I define most broadly as ADR plus some form of technology. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> But I, I'd like to, in the time we have, get to some of the substance of that question. Sharam, did you want to uh, take on the more substantive aspect of uh, the question uh, Tara raised? I think I've answered you know, a good part of that question. Okay. When I spoke about preparing the client for mediation, uh, making sure that they got the technology right, sending them a process note, uh, you know, uh, adjusting, uh, choosing technology well, so perhaps that question came in before I spoke. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I thought I'd answer that question. Um, what more would I like to say on that? I think you must, you must, you know, that comfort level, spend as much time as is necessary on it with the clients and the attorneys. Sometimes mediators, like, you know, mediators can rush through opening statements. I mean, this is the opening, I mean, this is the opening statement 10 times magnified in importance because you must make them completely conversant and comfortable with the, with the, with, with the, with the technology and the process um, and start it only when they're comfortable and make it clear to them that, look, if they slip up, it's not a problem. You're not going to get upset with them. Uh, you know, it's a new thing. It's new for everybody. So that, that max level of comfort, I think one should aim for. Um, but I think once they see how it works, they all come into it pretty well. You know. Good. Uh, yeah, I've never seen it, even whether it's families or you know whatever age groups. I mean, I have a 90-year-old uh, who's merrily chatting with me. She's the mother of those kids in that uh, in, 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 in that mediation, and I keep telling her, I said, you know, um, uh, ma'am, why don't you go and take some rest? Uh, there's no need for you to be on this call. All your children are here. That's enough. And she says, no, 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 I'm quite happy to be here. 
<laughs> so um, they all get it. You know, it's like uh, uh, I frankly, you know, if 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 I'm telling you, you'll come to a stage where online mediation will become so much the in thing that one day somebody will tell a real time mediation that oh, your virtual mediation. <laughs> Lila, how about you? And uh, turn your microphone on. Do you uh, have thoughts about how to make people more comfortable or respond to that question? Yeah, pretty much what. <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> pretty much what uh, Sri Ram said. Uh, just reduce their tension anxiety levels. So uh, we they sign to a confidentiality agreement. Uh, which will really lay out how it works in the online field. Then I might, you know, tell them uh, what are your concerns. Let's address it. If your concerns are about recording happening, I'm going to be controlling the recording. So I'll make sure that nobody records. And um, if please disclose if there's anybody else who's, you know, listening in. I keep uh, ensuring that there is. Uh, comfort on that and then I lock I tell them see now we have everybody there uh, we lock we, we use the locking facility so nobody else can come in and uh, I for private sessions I sent uh, different separate links so it's not I, I you know honestly I don't use too much of the waiting room I um, send separate links for zoom so they are sure that this link is only for them and I explain, you know, if you want, we can purge the documents. So I, I just explain the facilities that are available so that they are totally at ease. And we continue to work with them until they feel comfortable. Yeah. You have so many valuable tips. I just encourage the both of you to continue a webinar series. Uh, Bruce, including... may, I, may I add, may I yes, add to please. this answer? Please. There is one huge advantage that online mediation gives me in conducting a mediation. Earlier on, when I had contentious parties who would all keep shouting all the time and I had to raise my voice to control them, now it is brilliant, brilliantly easy. I just mute them. <laughs> <laughs> a so power simple. that we never uh, had in the past. That's it. <laughs> I just mute them and say, there you are, you know. It's the, brilliant. Uh, let me do this. Um, as we near the conclusion of our time, I would like to learn a little more from our audience. And I know we have another question to raise to find out more about how people have been using uh, online dispute resolution so far. And if our friends from IDEX Legal could put a next question on the board uh, for people to answer about the, the context of, of um, online dispute resolution. There it is. Um, and the question reads, in what context do you see virtual mediations working effectively? And the choices for this question are family law, community disputes, commercial or civil litigation, or some other forum. Please take a, a minute and just give us your answers because we like to learn from you as we move through this as well. Okay, I think everybody should have had a chance to identify the response and if you could put the responses up, we'll look at them together. Okay, so Oh, right. Wow, wow, that is interesting. Family law interesting. is 25%, community disputes 4%, and the vast majority at this point, 70% is commercial or civil litigation. Yeah. That surprises me yeah, a, a bit. Uh, um, Lila, what's your thought about that? Any reaction uh, to the poll result? Um, yes, uh, I would say yes. Very good for commercial and civil litigation. Very good for family law also, mm -hmm. because emotions, relationships, um, um, this, and mediation works very well for family law also. Um, for matrimonial disputes, it's, it's a must. 
Um, so I, I, I would give a higher rating for family law as well. Let's uh, go ahead and take the polling results off the screen, if you would. Uh, thank you. Um, in the few minutes that we have remaining, um, what I would like to do is hear from our esteemed uh, colleagues about their views of what this all means going forward. You know, what, is the, what is the future? And Lila, I'll, I'll start with you in terms of what do you see both in terms of camps focus and practice and really uh, I know a, it's a broad question but I'm, I'm going to impose it nonetheless for the future of online dispute resolution for India. Give me a minute or two of your thoughts on that broad topic. Um, Bruce, I'm very encouraged. If we handle this well, if we as a community understand the difference between virtual mediation where, as Sriram said, you give them a replicating experience of physical, then most people are going to really integrate technology into their mediations and make the practice so much easier for the parties and for the lawyers. And I, I can, you know, the, uh, the world is the playing field for the lawyers and for the mediators. You, you can mediate from any part of the world. So going forward, when things get better, we'll be combining face-to-face, -face, virtual, online, it will be a happy mix. And I think the practice is going to be so much easier and better for our litigants. Thank they you. have a good choice that will be available to them. I, I don't see the practice ever going back to what it was. I, I see a new kind of practice and the lawyers have to be ready for that. They should be excited about it to be able to sit in the luxury of their homes or their offices and conducting so many of their cases through mediation. Mm. And for the parties, they don't have to, you know, really struggle the way they've been struggling all these years. So I'm looking forward to that future. Thank you. Sharam, how about you? That same question. What does the future look like from your perspective? What do you hope it will take shape to become? Well, I hope it won't go back to the old where I have to struggle, you know, to travel and to meet all kinds of obstacles to get to mediation. So I'm hoping that will not come back. I'm hoping online will stay and will stay powerful. I think it will, you know, it's, it's in now. It's in the system, it's now in people's functions and, you know, certainly I have no intention of ever going back to what I used to do before. This is, this is not going away from me. Um, two other things broadly, and this, Bruce, this is to, you know, catch you up on something which we discussed years back, because you, you asked about the future and developments of mediation. And if you remember about a few years back, we discussed the need for some very senior people to get into the field of mediation. And so that both uh, the, the large the government and industry could see that, you know, um, we have mediation across all levels, uh, including very senior people. And, I'm glad to say that's being done and soon we'll have uh, some, some very good presences on the field. The other thing I'm happy to share is that uh, we have devised an online mediation training program. Uh, this has been devised by a very fine set of uh, 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 trainers and lawyers. Uh, that includes the Javad and uh, um, other colleagues and the group from Bombay called Presol, who actually, uh, it's a young group of lawyers and they got into online dispute resolution two or three years ahead of COVID. You know, and they got, it, they got into ODR firmly saying this is the way to go. Uh, and so when, 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 when COVID started, uh, they had, you had hit the ground running well before. So I reached out to them and said, look, now it's your responsibility to fashion a first class online mediation training program. So that's been done. That's been vetted by our senior trainers. And I'm glad to say that we're now in a position to present it to the courts, to the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court is happy with it, which I'm sure they will, they will then, I think, ask all the high courts in the country to, to follow uh, this. And so I think we have now a first class online uh, mediation, I think a regular 
four or five day training program going into all these aspects of the differential and the special communication skills and techniques and technology, you know, tailored what I was talking to you about. Uh, the third thing I want to mention is that uh, the emergence now of a full fledged center for mediation studies, for mediation studies and research, which has been started by the uh, the, the, Bishma Pitama, the, the, the great Chief Justice of our time, Justice Venkatshadeya, under his leadership, we starting the center. It is going to do long term, long range research um, and training in mediation, allied and new fields. So there's a lot of interesting and wonderful stuff happening, Bruce. So we look forward to your coming to India next. I Some things can't be matched. Some things, Bruce, cannot be done online. And that <laughs> is to sit down with you and have a drink and have a meal and spend time as friends. I look forward to that uh, connection myself. Uh, Lila, you had a comment before I say something? I just want to add to that. Today, uh, Bruce, uh, Bar Council of India has uh, come out with, I mean, uh, there is a mandatory mediation course for our law students. So all our law students are going to compulsorily be having to do a mediation training. And uh, also for the audience, we have another online training which CAP is also promoting with Bruce Edwards himself as the um, trainer which is also another brilliant 40 hour training. So I thank I just, you. The, wonderful, the beauty, wonderful. The yeah, beauty and of the, Ram and I are also featuring in that. The beauty of the online world that we are all now experiencing and promoting uh, includes online opportunities for training uh, and ultimately for mediation. So it's a brave new world uh, that we are all entering. Uh, I'll conclude by saying, uh, first of all, I, I agree with our panelists that um, the future is bright. We've all been exposed to uh, online mediation now in ways that we previously probably never envisioned. Maybe that's one of the few silver linings from the pandemic environment we find ourselves in. Uh, from afar, looking and seeing blue skies over Delhi and, uh, you know, different uh, changes in our environments uh, collectively. There's some, some, some bright things to think about. But the mediation world is also bright. And if you had asked me a year or two ago if I could have envisioned this, I would have said no. But um, uh, as I often remind myself, uh, in the words of uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, it always seems impossible uh, until it's done. And um, here we are uh, in the process of doing. So I encourage everybody to roll up their sleeves and to get involved and to experience uh, this uh, virtual uh, mediation world. Uh, give feedback to your mediators like Lila and Sharam uh, along the way and together we'll make it the best possible experience we can. Um, I'd like to personally thank both of you for your time this morning, your wisdom. It's uh, personally just uh, delightful to be in your presence, even for a short while. And um, I appreciate the, the friends at IDEX and CAMP for sponsoring uh, this today. And I, I wish you all good health and, and wellness going forward. So um, thank you for the collaboration. Thank you for the opportunity this morning, both of you. Thank you, Bruce. That was really wonderful. Thank, thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Lila. Wonderful to be with all both of you. Yeah. Before, we, before we sign out, um, that was a fantastic session. So many questions that we uh, have not had the chance to get to, but I want to reiterate that the fascinating discussion between Bruce, Sriram, and Lila is what has evoked all these fabulous questions. Uh, we will try to respond to each one of them. Thank you so much, Bruce, Lila, and Sriram. This was a fantastic way for us to be able to uh, launch our series. We will be having one every two weeks. Uh, the, the next one is on uh, October 8th. Uh, it will be a discussion on, again, a, a, a fascinating, timely discussion on the mediation law for India and how our practice is going to be changing with this law that is at its cusp. So uh, look forward to having everyone back. And as, as Bruce pointed out, this is a call out to change this, to make it happen. It's not impossible. And we're looking forward to a new way to be resolving disputes. So thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Take care. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, and Tara, all the very best. 
This is a wonderful new start for you in the United States. You couldn't have started on a better note. Congratulations and all the best. Thank you so much, Mr. Panchu. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. And Bruce and to, uh, everyone on the other side of the hemisphere, a wonderful day. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care.